just a few more minutes. Not a few, one second. Sure. So, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Medical Mondays with Dr. O, where we learn to improve our health, to prevent disease entities, and just to increase knowledge. I am Toyin Okwesomi, a family practitioner, HIV specialist, and I treat addictions in Maryland. We have the honor and privilege of having my brother, Dr. Natarajan Ravendran, on our program tonight. He's a board certified gastroenterologist, who we call GI specialist. He treats all digestive diseases, but specializes in the treatment of liver diseases. It's one of our best in the state of Maryland, if not in the US. So without much ado, I'm going to um, hand over the floor to Dr. Ravindran. So welcome and good evening. Good evening, my colleagues, my friends, and the public. Uh, Toin, thank you for your you know, kind invitation, as well as your kind introduction. Uh, you know, I'm very much privileged to share my knowledge with you all. And it also gives me great you know, happiness and pleasure that I always believe that knowledge is to be shared. What is the use of having knowledge if it doesn't help our community and our the humanity? So today I thought what I would do, two important topics. I'm trying to move my... And I am trying to um, move my slide also. Oh, here it is. It's, it, it, it's so. You know, where, yeah. where it says you are viewing your slide is blocking where I can expand my screen. So I don't know how to do that. I hope our IT uh, specialist can help me. Yeah. So can I you can, all see my slide? I can, yes. Others could see them, right? Okay. Yes. So yes. there are two so. topics I want to discuss today. One is colonoscopy and the benefits. The second one is very essential. It, we used to call them as non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. The nomenclature was just changed three weeks ago in Vienna, Austria, when International Liver Congress met. So I want to share with you all what is the new nomenclature, why the steatotic liver disease is very important. <laughs> globally. Now, the what are the common cancers we have in U.S.? Prostate, breast, and colorectal cancer. Prostate and breast cancers, there is, you can't prevent them. Whereas colorectal cancer can be prevented, or even it's not really just detected, you can prevent colon cancer through colonoscopy. In this day and age, people should not die from colon cancer. In the U.S., colorectal cancer is the third most common cancer in both men and women, yet it is one of the most preventable types of cancer. How do you prevent? Regular screening for and removal of growths in the colon, so-called polyps, reduces the risk of developing colorectal cancer by up to 90% with colonoscopy. You can prevent, not just to detect, colorectal cancer with a screening test called colonoscopy. Removing the precancerous growths in the colon called polyps reduces the risk of colorectal cancer. Almost 90 to 95% of colorectal cancer we see begins with a polyp. So by screening colonoscopy, removing the polyps, you prevent it. So this is the power of prevention. Screening is the power of the prevention. So the goal of the colorectal cancer screening is to reduce the incidence and mortality from colorectal cancer. For instance, any screening, the goal would be to reduce the incidence and mortality. For example, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, Barrett's esophagus. If you screen these you know, diseases, these conditions, we can reduce the incidence and mortality. That is the goal. The goal of a physician is to postpone the mortality and give the quality of life to the humanity. 
That is the goal of any physician should be. Now, what, what does colonoscopy have done? In the past 40 years, since we started doing colonoscopy, it has decreased the mortality of colorectal cancer by 57%. Still in 2023, we are going to see 150,000 new cases and 52,000 of them are going to die. Why? Because the penetration of screening colonoscopy has really not gone into depth enough. And we are also seeing increasing in younger age, especially between the 20 to 49 in the past decades. In from 2010, the, you know, the, the subjects or the people less than 50 years, mortality has increased by 3% annually due to colorectal cancer. Now, this is very important for our you know, African colleagues. Non-Hispanic Blacks seem to have increased in metastatic colon cancer. You all know Chadwick Boseman is the classic example of who died less than 45 with metastatic colon cancer. Now, recently I was told Christy Alley also died from metastatic colorectal cancer. Now, is the screening effective? There is one retrospective analysis they looked into 1.5 million people who had colonoscopy, by doing so, they decrease the mortality by 61%. So when we talk about colonoscopy, what I'm going to cover next in you know, 30 or 20 minutes, what is colonoscopy? How do you prepare for it? What are, what are the polyps, kinds of polyps? And what is the surveillance? Now, this is the colon. For those who have not seen it, you know, this is a classic example of colon. We put a scope, we put a light, a fiber optic through the rectum. It winds around this S-shaped sigmoid colon, goes all the way. This is a splenic flexure, winds around it, comes to the transverse colon, goes all, all the way into the cecum. Sometimes we do get into the terminal ileum, especially if you are suspecting Crohn's disease or diarrhea. But this is what colonoscopy means. But one thing we should not forget, this is an nice looking colon, but not every individual has this nice anatomy. Some of them have this sigmoid colon double loops. Sometimes the splenic flexure goes all the way up. Sometimes the transverse colon comes like an M shaped. Then hepatic flexure also goes all the way up. So it's very crucial for whoever does colonoscopy to look into the nooks and corners so that you don't miss any polyps. It's very crucial to know this anatomy. Now, this is what recent publication that shows. If you look into the bottom of the slide, starting from 1975 in 2014, you see the decline in mortality from colon cancer from, for both men and women. But on the same time, if you look in the top of the slide, you could see that between the age 20 to 49, the mortality rate from colon cancer has increased between the age 20 to 49. So once we made this observation, we did go back to the blackboard and changed our you know, criteria for our uh, guidelines and recommendation for colon cancer screening. This is the American Cancer Society. We used to say start at the age of 50, but currently we brought the bar, start the age at 45, especially my African colleagues should start colonoscopy at the age of 45. I'm re-emphasizing this. I'll share with you some of the data on that. Now, what about up to 75? We recommend screening. If they have a good health and life, we recommend them to do it every 10 years. Now, by doing a colonoscopy, you are prolonging the life expectancy by 10 years. Now, if the patients or the public is between 76 to 85, the decision to be screened is made based on the preferences, the life expectancy, overall health, and prayer screening history. And we do not recommend for screening anyone above the age of 86. Now, this is the ACG clinical guidelines. It's updated in 2021. I will go over with you again. I'm going to repeat the same. Between the age of 50 and 75, to reduce the incidence of adenoma and colorectal cancer and mortality, we are recommending everyone should have it. Now, based upon the recent data, we brought the bar down to age 45. And beyond 75, 
you should individualize each patient for screening. Now, we do recommend colonoscopy and FIT as the primary screening modalities for colorectal cancer screening. FIT stands for fecal immunoglobin test. I will give you uh, what, what it means in the few slides down. Now, one point, I, one bullet uh, I added in this slide is a cholagod. You all might have heard about cholagod. What is cholagod? Cholagod is a test checking the stool or FIT. FIT stands for, FIT stands for fecal immunoglobin test that tests stool for blood by immunoglobin. And also in cholagod, we are testing for DNA molecules of polyps, sometimes even the cancer cells, they shed off the DNA. By doing cholagod, you can pick up these cases, but we should not forget there are 13% false positive and 8% false negative. And this is not my go-to screening. Only we do cholagod on those patients who are very hesitant or those patients who have underlying comorb comorbid conditions with very high risk to go through colonoscopy, you can do cholagod. Now, look into this data. This is the Recent data that shows between 2000 and 2015, the colorectal cancer has increased by 17% in between the ages of 45 and 49. But if you look across, even below the, from the age 25 to 29, 50% increase we are seeing. I'll tell you what, this is based upon the CF data. If I see a patient, say 30 year old gentleman or lady comes into my office with rectal bleeding, I would not say you have hemorrhoids. Especially if you get the history, if they have any family history of colon cancer or colon polyps in their, in their you know, uh, brother, sister, father, mother, I would do colonoscopy. I would not hesitate or I would not you know, assume it is all hemorrhoids. Please, this should be take home message. If you see rectal bleeding, if you have any of your family member colon polyp, please get colonoscopy. So this is the United States you know, a Preventive Service Task Force has given this uh, in 2021, between the age of 41, between the age of 45 and 49, it has adopted this guideline. So based upon that, Medicare does cover if you're between the age of 45 and 49 to do the screening. As you all know, when Medicare covers, all the other insurance insurers follow in <coughs> guidelines. Now, what is the benefit of starting at 45? Sometimes, you know, if you start at the 45, those patients whom we believe they will wait up to 50 and 55, you can bring them earlier. So if you bring the bar down, you can cover those cohort also. So there is an advantage of starting these patients earlier. Now, I think I have already, you know, uh, uh, went over when to stop the screening between 75 and 85 individualize each decision over the age of 85 we discourage the screening because the harms outweigh the benefits risk of anesthesia risk of other complications for instance if you look into this the, this lady 86 year old lady she has hypothyroidism osteoarthritis she never had a prior screening she has been very healthy would you do screening? My answer would be no. On the right hand side, if you look at this gentleman who is eight years old, osteoarthritis, coronary artery disease, end stage renal disease, Parkinson's disease. He had negative colonoscopy three times at the age of 50, 60, and 70. There is no family history. Would you do screening? My answer would be no. I would stop. So these are all the you know, comorbid conditions, these are all the factors to take into an account to make the decision when to stop the screening. It's not a cookbook, you have to individualize each patient. Now, I think I mentioned about FIT. FIT is a fecal immunochemical test. It is, there's a higher adherence. If you tell the patient, I want to do FIT test, they will ob oblige to. But once you do the FIT test, you have to follow with colonoscopy, if they are positive. But the problem with FIT test, it does not pick up serrated polyp. Not only that, you have to have a, a follow-up you know, plan. If FIT comes back positive, you should follow that with colonoscopy. 
It's very essential. Now we look into this data. I, you know, I'll take out a few minutes. Starting from left hand, African American, in one study, only 34% of them had screening colonoscopy. Whereas in Caucasian, 47% had this is an update, you know, uh, uptake of colonoscopic examination. Still, we feel African American, you know, uh, uh, public are not getting colonoscopy as we desire. And look into the right hand side, all right extreme. Even Asian population has a low uptake, especially currently, we are recommending even all Indians, you know, because they think they won't get colon, colon polyp or colon cancer, only Caucasians will get. That is not true. All, because there are some studies that have shown the colon, colon cancer affects all of them across the board in US. This is based upon the data. So why is screening for black adults is, uh, why we are seeing highest incidence in mortality? Because we are seeing more Black Americans getting colon cancer below the age of 50, number one. Number two, there are still inequities in access and utilization rate among black adults. And also quality of CRC screening is not good. And the treatment is also not followed well. But US preventive you know, service task force cannot separate it and say, you have to do X, Y, and Z for black adults, no. We give the same guidelines for all the races. In, in other words, everyone should have colonoscopy starting from the age of 45. Now, this is very crucial for my you know, friends, my colleagues, and the public. <clears throat> Before you do colonoscopy, please, preparation, preparation, preparation. It is so crucial. If you are not well prepared, doing colonoscopy is useless. Even with a good preparation, you can miss polyps one to two percent if you are not a good colonoscopist. Because remember, I showed these angles. When you go around the splenic flexure, when you go around the hepatic flexure, there are certain areas, there are blind spots. I go back second times, look around to make sure I don't miss it. And also, it's very important for you to stay on clear liquid diet at least for 24 hours. Avoid corn nuts and creamy food for at least 48 hours before the procedure. Reason is when you eat corn, when you do colonoscopy, if it comes and clogs the suction channel, I cannot suction the air or suction the liquid, we can miss stuff. So please avoid corns and nuts for 48 hours. And please follow the instructions given by your physicians, whoever does colonoscopy, up to the dot, read it and make sure you follow the instructions. Why it is important, look into this. There are two pictures, I have one on the left side. I don't consider it as a good prep. Whereas one on the right side, you see how clean, how nice it is. That is a colon I want to have. I would give A, A plus for that colon, B minus or C plus for the left-hand side. So it's very essential for you to come with the colon just like on the right side, because you can easily miss polyps on the colon on the left side. Currently, we are using split dose. Now, when you are using the split dose, the second dose should be taken four to six hours prior to the colonoscopy. You should finish the prep at least two hours prior to colonoscopy. I would recommend even go up to three hours prior to the colonoscopy because some anesthesiologists won't put you to sleep if you're not NPO for at least three hours. Now, adequate preparation should be achieved in at least 85% of cases, but I demand more than 95% because if the preparation is inadequate, you have to repeat it within one year. Otherwise, you are going to miss the polyps. So this is a study that looked into that. The split prep versus non-split prep. If you look into the slide, the blue bar is a split prep. What do I mean by split prep? You have to split the dose into two halves. The first half, you have to take the prior you know, evening. The second dose you take six to eight hours prior to the procedure, six to eight hours prior to the procedure. So the studies have shown by doing the split prep, you can increase the adenoma detection rate as opposed to that orange bar, which people did not split the prep. 
So split prep, split prep, split, split prep. If your colonoscopist is not recommending, please ask for that. Now, this is, uh, this, what is, this is the quality indicators for colonoscopy. Split dose purgative preparation. Six trials looked directly into this. What is a split dosing? With PEG, PEG stands for polyethylene glycol, which is the uh, uh, Myrelax, sodium phosphate or both, all showed split dosing is superior to the single dose administration on the day before the colonoscopy. Now, when we document, when I do the procedure, I always, we have to document this. Is it an excellent prep? We give nine out of nine points, you know, three segments, three and three and three, left to right and transverse colon. If it is a good, we can detect polyps above five millimeter. Fair, detect polyps above one centimeter, but fair is not good enough for me. I want all my colonoscopy excellent, at least if not good. This is what we recommend. Our ASG stands for American Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy Society recommends. Everyone should have good. If you do a fair, if you do a colonoscopy, if the preparation is fair, please talk to your patient. Bring them back within one or two years. But economically, doing every five years will make sense. But as I said, if the preparation is not good, please don't let your patient you know, come back or wait for five years. What are, what are the types of polyps we have? What are the characteristics? Number one, histology is very important. Histologically, we can define them as tubular polyp, villous polyp, tubular villous polyp, and serrated polyp. Location is also important, right side versus left side. The size of the polyp is important. Is it less than six millimeter or six to nine millimeter or larger than one centimeter? Dysplasia, when we say adenoma, all the adenoma have dysplastic cells. Now, if it is low, moderate and high-grade dysplasia, they are not cancerous. But if you have a high-grade dysplasia, within few months to an year, they are turned, they can turn into cancer. Those are all the polyps you want to remove them, don't want to wait, you know. Now, what about hyperplastic polyps? Hyperplastic polyps never, never turns into cancer. So sometimes I don't even take them out. I'll show you, these are the polyps. I have these three slides. If you look into the left to the right, look on the right side. This is the polyp. If you look on the, you know, the surface of the polyp, it's almost too villous. It's a very sessile. You can imagine if you are not clean, you can miss this polyp. This polyp, they, it may have a high grade dysplasia. This is the kind of polyp. If you miss it within two to three years, the patient will get cancer. And these are all the two polyps. We call them serrated polyps. You could see the mucus. You have to wash it well to, to see the polyp underneath. So this is actually published in the New England Journal of Medicine about 10 years ago. This article clearly showed when you remove the adenoma, that you halved the death due to carcinoma by you know, 50%. This cohort who did not undergo colonoscopy, the expected was 25 death, whereas when they had polyps and removed the death rate by 50%. This is the proof we have colonoscopy prevents or decreases the mortality of colon cancer. Now, when you stratify them based upon the adenomas, low risk adenomas and intermediate risk adenomas, I will follow it. This is the advanced adenoma. If you have a villous tissue or any adenoma more than one centimeter or high grade dysplasia, we call them advanced adenoma. These patients, this cohort, this public will require close surveillance, they should have colonoscopy every three years. Now, hyperplastic polyp, as I mentioned, they do not become cancerous at all. In fact, this is the way it looks when you do colonoscopy with an experienced eye. If you see a hyperplastic polyp, you don't have to remove because each time you take a polyp out, there is a cost. It costs $150 to the patient, to the insurance company. And since there is no dysplastic potential, there is no benefit in removing I recommend not to remove it, but you have to have an experienced eyes to know which is a hyperplastic polyp. This is called a sessile serrated polyp. 
they have the higher potential to become cancerous, you should remove them. Now, what is the current recommendation? After you had the colonoscopy, it is so essential to have a high quality colonoscopy. You have to go all the way to the cecum, number one. Number two, your preparation is very good to detect polyps above five millimeter, and you have to remove polyp completely. Now, once you have done that, once your colonoscopy is good, this is what we recommend. If it is normal, we can bring the patient every 10 years. If you find one to two adenomas, if it is less than 10 millimeter, you should bring them between seven to 10 years, the second colonoscopy. If they have one to two sessile serrated polyp, if they are less than 10 millimeter, we can bring them back anywhere between five to 10 years. If you have more than three to four adenomas, if you have you know, polyps more than increased size, more than 10 millimeter, you should bring them back in three to five years. If you have more than 10 adenomas, you should bring them back in one year. So this is the current recommendation. After we do the colonoscopy, we give the recommendations. We used to give five years until, you know, 10 years ago. Now the bar is changing. From five years, we brought it to five to seven. Now, if I have a patient, I took one or two tiny polyps, I bring them back in seven years. So what is this, the surveillance? Once you have done polypectomy, how do you bring them back or how do you keep them under surveillance? Depends upon the family history, the personal history of colorectal cancer, and also the number of polyps you removed and the histology. This is what we recommend, screening, average risk, bring them back at 10 years, begin the age of a 10, if you have a one single first degree relative with cancer at the age above 60, you bring them back at 10 years. But if you have two first degree relative with cancer or one first degree relative diagnosed at the age below 60, like your parent, your brother, your sister, they should start the colonoscopy at the age of 40 or 10 years younger, whichever is earlier. For instance, if you're say if your sister had a colon cancer at the age of 45, you should start your colonoscopy at the age of 35, 10 years young. If you have an endometrial or ovarian cancer below the age of 50, you should have colonoscopy every five years. If you have hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer, this is a, a very small cohort, very small percentage of population will fall in this category. We recommend them starting at the age of between 20 and 25, and they should be screened every one to two years, surveillance. I think we already went through that. How do you screen them? One thing, after you had a colon cancer resection, you should have a colonoscopy at year one, at three years, and then at five years, and thereafter every five years. The reason is, even if you remove the cancer, there may be a tiny cancer that could have missed elsewhere in the colon, because you had cancer at one location, we call metachronotic cancer. There's always a chance. So it is better to do colonoscopy and year after you get surgery. Now, this is very crucial. This is what we, you know, for uh, uh, who is a good colonoscopist? Now, if you're if you doing an asymptomatic screening, at least more than 25% of men will have a polyp. In other words, if I do 100 colonoscopy, I should be able to pick more than 25 polyps in 25 men, more than 15 out of 100 women should, I should have picked up polyps. If I don't, I'm not doing a good colonoscopy. I'm missing them. So look into this polyp. This is a two centimeter polyp. When we cut, this is the way base should look. The base does not look like this. That means you have missed, you have not excised completely. And we recommend anyone, any polyp less than two centimeter should be done should be removed by the colonoscopist. They should not go for surgery. So what about the incidence of perforation? Now, if you're doing a screening colonoscopy perforation or making a hole in the colon, one out of 100,000, that is a perforation rate. Now, out of that you know, one, out of 100 colonoscopy perforation, five out of 100 will die. 
So it is a very, very low chances to die from colonoscopy. So you have to take it to an account that many patients are so scared, they might have heard some of their friends or someone had a you know, screening colonoscopy and had perforation. That chances is very, very low. What about the post polypectomy? You can have bleeding is the most common complication. Overall risk is less than 1%. Currently we can put clips. And if it is a, about two centimeter, it exceeds 10%. When I remove a polyp about two centimeter, I put few clips so that they don't bleed. So what is the future stands for? In future, what we are going to be doing, we will be screening our patients based upon the risk factors and genetics. We'll be doing more non-invasive tests. We are, we are doing what we call as a liquid biopsy. We can do blood tests. In the blood test, we can do mRNA-based testing. Gastroenterologists will focus on polyp resection. You don't want to leave any polyp behind. Artificial intelligence will be adopted to pick up the tiny polyps. When you're doing a colonoscopy, if you miss, AI would say, hey, wait a minute, you're missing this. Look on the right side, left side. So this is what the future is going, future technology is going. 10-year intervals for colonoscopy, quality colonoscopies, and computer-friendly EGHR. shot. This is the way the future is going to be evolving. And I think I'm going to stop the colonoscopy and I will move on to the next topic. I will save the next last 10 minutes for questions. So next, you know, maybe 10 minutes, I will talk about the steatotic liver disease. I think what we have learned, what we learned is this entity has been present almost 30 years. We have known about steatotic liver disease 30 years. The chief, the mentor, my mentor, Dr. Leon Schiff, is an internationally famous physician. Hepatologist used to tell me that he has done liver biopsy on a lady seven years, every year, you know, every year successively to prove the fact steatotic liver disease went on to have cirrhosis. This is the old terminology. This is the current terminology. Currently, we don't call our patients as fatty liver disease. We call them steatotic liver disease. Why did we change the nomenclature? Because this makes sense. Because when you say fatty liver, everybody feels they are fatty. That is not true. Steatotic liver disease can be due to various reasons. As you see here, I have you know, given four classification. One is called muscle D. Can you all see, you all can see the slide, right, Toyin? Yes, we can. Okay. So one is called MAS-LD. MAS-LD stands for Metabolic Dysfunction Associated Steatotic Liver Disease. Now, who would qualify for that? You have to have a cardiometabolic risk factors. I will go over with you in the next slide. And there is a second cohort. They are called MET-ALD. MET-ALD stands for mass and Increased Alcohol Intake. There is a cohort of patient I see, they have both D and they also drink alcohol. What do you mean by alcohol drinking? If you take 20 to 50 grams of alcohol every day in females, 30 to 60 grams of alcohol every day in males, you qualify for MET ALD. Can there you transfer that into glasses or bottles for us? So we oh, can okay, sure. <laughs> I think so. It's a, if you are look, if you are sick, I'll give you an example. If you're drinking wine, five ounces of wine, you can drink two glasses, you know, uh, that will qualify for, for 15, 30 grams. So we recommend two five ounce glasses of wine for men, one five ounce glass of wine for females, one beer, one shot of whiskey, two shots of whiskey for males, one shot of whiskey for females. So that is an equivalent, you know. Now moving to the third bulletin point is the alcoholic liver disease, which is all purely alcohol related. Those patients do not have any metabolic dysfunction at all. And let's not forget, you can see steatotic liver disease due to certain medication, classically methotrexate and amiodarone can cause steatosis. And also there is a certain disease like glycogen metabolic diseases, some monogenic disease like 
fatty acid, deficiency disease, they all can cause steatotic liver disease. So here afterwards, we do not, we are not going to call as non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We are going to call as steatotic liver disease and MASLD and METILD. This is a new nomenclature. Now, this is the cardiometabolic criteria. What do I mean by that? If you have BMI about 25 kilograms, or if your waist is more than 94 centimeter in males or 80 centimeter in females, if your fasting glucose is more than 100 milligram, or two hour post prandial is 140 milligram, or hemoglobin A1C is above 5.7%, or if you have type 2 diabetes mellitus. If you have blood pressure above 130 or 85, or if you are on treatment for blood pressure, if your triglycerides is above 150 milligram, or you are on lipid lowering treatment, or plasma HDL is less than 40 milligram, or on lipid lowering treatment. This is what the cardiometabolic criteria. If you have any one of these, and if you do a sonogram, the sonogram shows steatosis, you do qualify for mass leading. Now, this is what the natural progression. I will walk you through that. You see on the left-hand side is a normal liver. The second is a steatosis. We, I call it as a benign fatty liver. Here, if you do a liver biopsy, there is no inflammation, no hepatocyte ballooning. I do have a biopsy slide. I'll share this with you. The second, the, from the NAFL, you move on to NASH. NASH is characterized by, on biopsy, fatty liver with inflammation. And then these patients will, once they get inflammation, they get fibrosis and cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. Let me give you some numbers. If you have 80% of the patients with fatty liver or steatosis, 20 of them will get into steatohepatitis. Three or four of them will develop cirrhosis. But imagine if you have 30% of the population has globally, you know, NAFLD. Uh, please forgive me, this slide still says NAFLD because these slides were made a month ago. So we have not changed it yet. So if you look into this globally, all across from North America to Africa, 30% of the population currently have fatty liver disease. So you look into that, of 30%, if the 3% of them have cirrhosis, you can imagine the number of patients, the number of, number, number of people worldwide will develop cirrhosis. Why in Africa it is very low? I do not believe this 13% number is correct because unfortunately they, you know, they did not have ultrasound everywhere. So they collected the data based upon the ALT. So we do not know. And they are also, some of these patients will have both hepatitis B and non-alcoholic fatty liver concomitantly or steatotic fatty liver. Now, if you have obesity, 82% of them will have NASH or MASH, which is uh, they will have inflammation and ballooning degeneration. Type 2 diabetes patients, 44% of them will have it. In fact, current American Diabetic Association recommends every diabetic patient should be screened for steatotic liver disease, you know, by doing liver enzymes, by getting uh, uh, ultrasound. What about hyperlipidemia? 72% of them will develop MASH. Hypertension, 68% of the patients with MASH will have hypertension. Patients with MASH, 71% will have metabolic syndrome as evidenced by obesity, type 2 diabetes, dyslipidemia, and hypertension. Now, this is currently, this is the data in 2013, liver transplant in at, in at, at Hopkins, I will sit in the transplant committee. Almost every 30 to 40 percent of the transplant listed at Hopkins currently is for the NASH induced cirrhosis. So the numbers are increasing. What about cancer? Prevalence of cancer due to NASH or MASH is increasing. Main risk factors are older age, diabetes, advanced fibrosis, and obesity. Almost doubles the you know cancer risk. The cancer by NASH, the interval rate is five months. Within five months, they double the, uh, the sizes of the lesion. But unfortunately, our current guideline says every six months you do the screening. But, and I had a patient whom I did the ultrasound in December 2022, 
it was normal. In June 2023, he had two lesions. Unfortunately, those two lesions were five centimeter and two centimeter. In fact, I'm still uh, uh, contemplating for a transplant because he's 62 year old gentleman. And when you have NASH, they also have higher incidence of cardiovascular disease. The cumulative incidence of cancer, 2.4% to 12.8% over a period of three to 7.2 years. In other words, if you see a patient with NASH and increased fibrosis, you should always think about cancer in that patient and follow them, put them on the screening. Unfortunately, NASH is a silent disease, very minimal symptomatology. By the time they get symptoms, such as variceal hemorrhage, hepatocellular carcinoma, liver failure, it is too late. So this is what happens in pathogenesis of NASH. What is the underlying pathogenesis? Is the accumulation of fat in the liver. What is the contributing factor? Insulin resistance, having too much fat peripherally, having too much fat in the visceral. The fat cells, we call them adipocyte, they secrete certain cytokines called pro-inflammatory cytokines. They also secrete a cytokine called adiponectin, which protects the liver, which protects the inflammation. Unfortunately, if you get too many fat cells, all the fat cells undergo metabolic stress. When they undergo metabolic stress, they release more inflammatory cytokines and that cytokines goes to the liver. And in the liver, you get inflammation and progresses to the cirrhosis. So this is, let me walk you through the slide of starting from the left hand. See here the steatosis. What you see here is only fat cells. You see all the globs, they're all the fat. On the next stage, you get the inflammation. Here in the inflammation, you see both polymorph leukocytes as well as mononuclear. In this inflammatory cells, you are not seeing any cellular death. Now, if you have cellular death, like we call, this is called a ballooning degeneration. So when you see these three, you know, fact three characteristics, such as steatosis, lobular inflammation, and ballooning degeneration, you have to have all these three things to qualify to call this patient to have NASH or MASH. Once you get the MASH, you should look for any scar tissue. If you look, this is a scar. You see the perisinusoidal fibrosis. There's a good indication if the patient has fibrosis, especially stage two fibrosis, they are more prone to develop cirrhosis and cancer. So it's very important to pick up those patients. How do you pick up in this day and age? I will just go over with you. There are two blood tests I do. It's called the ELF and FIB4. Look into the ELF. If you look into the AUROC, which is a good indicator above 85%, it is 90% to pick up stage three and four, almost 82% to pick up stage four. So the ELF test is good. It is a blood test we do. Both, I think uh, LabCorp does that. Until recently, this was not done in US. It was done in UK for the past 10 years. Just it took long time to move across the transatlantic. And we do FIF4. FIF4 involves age of the patient, AST, ALT, and platelet count. If you plug them in the, there is an algorithm. You can, in the computer, there's an app. If you put those things forward, it will give you the score. If you have FIP4 about 3.25, that means they have cirrhosis. This is the blood test. Then the non-invasive blood test, this is called elastography. You all must have heard about fibroscan or transient elastography. If you look into the AUROC or the AUROC, it is 0 0.93. So transient elastography is a very good tool to differentiate between scar tissue. Who has got stage three, four, or stage four disease? So this is what I do in my practice. If you have a patient who has got you know, fatty liver or steatotic liver, and if you do a FIB4, if it goes above 1.25, Next thing I do is the transient elastography. So currently to pick up the steatosis, we do sonogram. Sorry, I'm taking more time. So let me go to the treatment. Uh, this is the current management. 
Currently, we don't have any FDA-approved pharmacotherapy. We, only thing we have is the dietary lifestyle modification and bariatric surgery. What do we know about that? This is the current guidelines. Weight loss is very important. If they lose 7 to 10% of weight, it improves the histopathology, including fibrosis. What diet is the best? Currently, we recommend Mediterranean diet based upon the trials. Now, look into this slide. Sorry. The, if you lose more than 10% of the weight, this is the goal I give it to my patient. I give them more than 10% of weight loss over a period of two years. The fibrosis regress. But unfortunately, only less than 10% of them achieve and maintain that. And even if they lose more 7% of their weight, they can resolve NASH, the inflammatory process, which, in, which also you know, stimulates the fibrous formation. And these are all the molecules currently on you know, uh, the therapeutic targets. I have done quite a few of these targets. Many of them failed, unfortunately, in phase two. So we still have not come to any good molecule crossing the phase three and FDA approval, not yet. <laughs> but I know there is one molecule is currently being tested. In the next six months to one year, it might make it. It is a TH2 thyroid, <laughs> thyroid globin 2 agonist stimulator on the hepatocyte. So the summary of weight loss, I think I already talked to you. And so we recommend, there is no recommendation to restrict sugar, but we recommend limit the sugar in patients with fatty liver disease. And this is actually shows, even if you limit the non-nutritive sweetener, you still decrease the fat content in the liver. Now, I think I will uh, go to the last, not really that, you not only ask your patient to change the diet, and also you should target the heart healthy diet. It's very crucial. And Mediterranean diet is the only diet that has been shown in the study wise. In the study, if you, if you see that here, the liver fat on Mediterranean diet is in the blue bar decreases by more than you know, 5%. And also the insulin decreases it. So, so we recommend Mediterranean diet. What does it consist of? Fresh fruits and vegetables, whole grains, less meat and dairy than a typical Western diet. Very little red meat. And this study shows that on patients six months on Mediterranean diet, you could see almost from 52% of patients severe steatosis came down to 9%. So what about the other diet like Jenny Craig and Weight Watchers? We do not have any evidence in fatty liver, in steatotic liver disease. So we cannot recommend them without any good evidence. So again, only Mediterranean diet is a good choice for balanced diet with a strong evidence for benefit. I think this is my last slide. It's a healthy eating, very important Mediterranean diet. Harvard healthy eating plate Take, don't fill your plate, take small portion. Eliminate the sugar, sweet, and beverage. I recommend do not drink Coca-Cola and all kinds of sugary products. Use healthy oils like olive oil and canola, portion control, minimize restaurants. Don't you know, go to the restaurant, but take small amount of food and avoid fast foods and avoid eating at night. And I think I'll stop here because I crossed my time. Wow. Wow. Thank you so very much. Ooh, I've learned a lot there. So if you please put down your slides so that I can see the hands of people. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. I'm going to look in the chat box. I was so engrossed in the conversation that I did not check the chat box at all, all through this conversation. Um, thank you so much for that awesome education. I do want to say, uh, ask you a question myself before anybody has the chance to raise their hand. I have um, time. Uh, Toyin, I have time. Oh, thank you. Did you see me going like a speed on <laughs> Gonzalez? Just speeding. Thank you. My apologies for running over for everyone, you know. <laughs> thank you. So, whew, 
you said in diabetic patients, um, we should screen for um, liver function yes. tests. Correct. So, and then ultrasound. So is it when the liver function test is elevated that we check ultrasound or regardless, we should do it? Is that we recommend regardless of... Uh, regardless. Because the right, reason is, I'll tell you, I'll give you an example. Reason. reason is there are certain patients who have burnt out liver disease. They are normally AST, ALT. Because some of them may already have cirrhosis. You know, cirrhosis itself, unless they get to decompensate, you know, you cannot diagnose cirrhosis. That's true. Right. Unless we do the ultrasound. So that is that a new standard? Yes. Thank yes. you. The, Thank you so much. I'm screening all my diabetic patients. I appreciate that. Before I go to the next question, Dr. Famuiwa, God bless you. I see you driving, but you have your hand raised. So please unmute. You, you, you're still muted. You're muted. Oh, hello? Okay. Yes, go ahead. Um, hello? Can yeah, you hear hi. Can hear you now. Hey, Amy, how are you? Hi, how are you? I'm so <laughs> sorry. I was trying to fight with my phone. Um, excellent, excellent talk. I, I'm just in awe, you know, because everything you're talking about is what we talk about for fertility. You know, the Mediterranean diet, the inflammatory processes, I tell my patients all the time and they go, oh, can I just lose a pound or two? But now I have ammunition. I say, look, you can do this for your eggs or you can do it for your liver. Which do you want? But I yeah. have a question for you. Do you rec at what level of hemoglobin A1C would you advise a, a, a liver sonogram? Wow, that's, a, that's, a, that's an excellent question. <laughs> a very good question. We do not have a data on that, but what I would recommend above six. Okay. Hemoglobin above six. Now, as you know, there is a pre-diabetic, correct? Remember 5.7, 5.8. Now, even the pre-diabetic itself is an indicator that that patient may have steatotic liver disease because they are already developing insulin resistance. How, what do I mean by that? See, in these patients, the adipocyte, you know, normal adipose, we have called them good adipocytes and bad adipocytes. Okay. So good adipocytes create adiponectin, which prevents the inflammation. You know, if the bad adipocyte is the one that breaks down and releases a lot of free fatty acid in spite of insulin coming to that cell because it becomes insulin resistant, you know. So I hope I answered your question. To be very yeah, quick, about six, right. About six, what level of triglycerides would you also say? Oh, 150. Oh, anything above 150. Correct, exactly. Uh, even if the LDL and HDL. And okay, sure, okay, sure like I'll that. answer to that. HDL is, less, HDL is more important than the LDL. HDL, if it is less than 30 in, you know, in males, less than 40 in females, you should screen them. Now, if the LDL is above 100, and if the HDL is less than 30, you have to screen them. Okay, got it. Thank you. Sure. And anything below 150 triglycerides is normal. So got it. Unless you... if they are on medication, you should still screen them. Got you. Got you. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for you know discussing those new standards so that you know we can incorporate it into practice. You know, it is said that um, in 2034, the number of people with diagnosed and undiagnosed diabetes will increase from 23.7 million to 44.1 million. That is staggering. That is just insane. Um, so. I think there was a question I saw on the chat box. Yeah, I'm going, I'm going through the questions because I don't want us to miss anybody. Okay. okay. So. Um, Benjamin said, what is the way forward for citizens of developing countries such as, such, as, such as Nigeria? And Benjamin, I'll tell you, Dr. Ravendra does medicine here and overseas. He has a passion for Nigeria. I you know, was taking him to Nigeria in, I think it was 20, 2016, something like that, to do hepatitis B. And you are still on because we're still going to go do that. So 
He has a passion. Sure. Uh, yeah, I can share that with you. Actually, you are exactly correct. So what is happening in my own observation? Because I have a passion for African-Americans and liver disease. Now, I have a whole cohort of patients from Ghana. They all have hepatitis B. So when I treat them, their liver enzymes are still abnormal. So when I did the sonogram, they all have fatty liver. So, so, the, the, so the axiom saying that Africans don't get fatty liver is not true. Then when I started digging deep, you know, the type of food they eat, there is a very high carbohydrate diet. There's a particular yes. food they eat. They keep it under the ground. It, you know, And so then I realized it. That is the reason why they're having increased incidence of fatty liver. So I'm able to observe it and advise them to stop eating that and follow the liver enzymes and my fibro scan, I do see some improvement. Again, that is an anecdotal. I have not published this, but this is my observation. So even though African you know, continent, we should still be cognizant, they can get fatty liver also, you know? Dr. Ravendra, yes. when you were presenting that, you were right on the money when you said that, you know, um, wherever, whichever way people got those numbers. Who keeps the statistics in Africa? By right. people here? Nobody. We don't Thank have you. it. We Thank don't you. have it. So we need to do a better job with stats in Africa. You know, we need to, um, and it's not the fault of uh, people there. It's, you know, there are, there's work to be done. So those numbers are not correct. Africans right. do get fatty liver. And I'm not sure if, what you're talking about is kinky. I don't know if that's what it is. We need to find out what it is because I have lots of Ghanaians brothers and sisters and you know, uh, you know that uh, need to know so yes, that yes, we can prevent. Who data? We have data now. Um, who is that? Who wants to have that conversation? Anyways, so the question is this, what is the way forward for citizens of developing countries such as Nigeria where the health system is not there yet, especially in terms of awareness of colonoscopy cancer prevention tests. As we speak, our health system is not even at the level we all expect it to be. And that the, be the beloved among our people know that some of these preventable ailments are more spiritual attacks than anything, it's true. They we will blame things on spirituality when <laughs> in fact, you know, um, they are preventable. So what is your take on it? What can one do in countries like that when, you know, colonoscopy is easily accessible or it's, um, it's not a routine test? And I, I would like to add, Dr. Ravendra, that even in, in London, in, in the UK, is the same thing, where we have these standards. I have a friend who turned 50 years ago, and I asked, you know, so, so I told her, I said, hey, now you're going to get colonoscopy. She turned 50 before me. So I said, you're going to get colonoscopy? She said, no, it's not standard here. She's a nurse in London. Uh, if you don't have symptoms, you don't get it. So what would be your advice for that? I mean, that is true. In in UK, they're not doing it. Now, for instance, if you go to like Poland, the bar is 55, you know, the screening bar. Yeah. 55. So I think, but in US, at least, thank God, we have the, you know, but I would recommend, especially the Nigerian population in London, at least to pay from the pocket, get it in it, because it saves life. You are going to add 10 more years of your life, you know, uh, if you pick a polyp, and then not only that, you can follow up. I said in this day and age, people should not die of colon cancer young. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for the matter of fact, any age, you know. Yes, you know, you presented a sixty-one percent decrease, right, in colon exactly. cancer just by screening, and it doesn't cost. It doesn't. I mean, it doesn't take much. You yeah. you'll be sleeping through it. Correct. But, the, the, the difficult part of it, I say all the time, I've had it twice, is the prep. Correct. You, stay in the, you, you stay on the commode all through the night. It That's is worth it. It is worth yes. it. Yes, absolutely. So it is, it is something that everybody should do. Um, Haman, he 
zoomed in from London. Oh, hi. Okay. <laughs> he says um, he had a colon cancer test earlier this year on the NHS and was passed clear. But this presentation is giving him a greater insight to the subject matter and clear pathways to engage with uh, his medical doctor and consultants. He said he will go back and have a more in-depth conversation with his results, with his consultant shortly and have good relationship with them. Quite eye-opening awareness that you raised, he said. Thank you, thank you, Herman. Good luck and, you know, sometimes we have to ask for it, you know? Yes, I agree. I mean, I go ahead. That's the main reason I am, we should, the public should know that, especially if you're a minority community, you know? And it, it should know that. I mean, then if you don't ask, you don't get it, right? That's right. And we, you know, people, not everyone has a good intention. <laughs> I don't know what to say, but, you know, I want to be careful in my statement, you know. You're right on point. That's all I'll say. Always right on point. So um, Haman also asked if there are any stats for the Caribbean population. We do have some Caribbean that you're also zooming. So thank you, Herman, for thinking about our Caribbean brothers and sisters. So any stats there? Is it worse than uh, Africans or black is black? I mean, <laughs> yes, exactly. I think that, I mean, we have seen, oh, we, we at least in the US, we have a lot of Caribbeans from TNT, you know, Trinidad and Tobago. I have many patients from TNT. We talk about cricket and also do chronoscopy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, they come, they come. I do see them. And it is the same across the board. You know, um, I think the Western diet, we are adopting more of red meat and, you know, not. See, even the, there is a theory why younger people are getting it. It's because of we are not ambulating. We are not doing exercise. We are eating processed food. You know, those are all the trigger factors, you know, um, for the increase in colon cancer in a younger age group. That's right. Thank you. Diet is, is huge. It's, it is huge. Okay. Um, this is Rafu from Nigeria. You know, in Nigeria now, it's uh, after 1 a.m. in the morning. In the UK, it's after 1 a.m. also um, for Haman. So he says, how often do you reach the start of the large intestine when you do colonoscopy? <laughs> so, you mean how, how often you? No, how often do you reach the start? of the large intestine. So it's asking, when you do colonoscopy, you know, you start from the rectum. Right. You go through the, to the uh, large intestine. You, yes, you go through the cecum, you go all the way to the- um, Ilium. The ilium, right. you go all over. See, he's asking the large intestine, what they think about is that first Correct. Um, Correct. longitudinal part. He said, how often do you get there when you do colonoscopy? 100%, <laughs> I think, yes. <laughs> You go uh, beyond so, there. <laughs> right. I mean, if you don't go there, I mean, there are some reasons you can't. Number one, if you have very severe diverticulosis in the sigmoid colon. Number two, if you have a huge loop, I would say 98 to 99% of the time, a good colonoscopist should be able to reach, you know, uh, cecum. If they have less than 5%, I mean, if they don't, if the number is more than 5%, they have to go back and get more training or we should look into why not, you know? So when we train our fellows, we teach them, especially nowadays with all the good techniques, you know, so. You know, thank you so much. And thank you, excellent question, I think, because- um, Yes, yes, there was, yes. There, there was, there was um, there's the talk about doing CT scan in place of colonoscopy. Or, you know, some people have talked about, you know, just doing sigmoidoscopy. I look at it and I'm like, why? If you're going, if you're going to do sigmoidoscopy, why don't you do the whole thing? One, why would you do CT scan? When, when you do colonoscopy, you go in there, if there's polyp, you take it out and it's a cure right, right away. Got it. Got it. And then with the pathology, when you get your pathology result, then you can then decide when they should come back. Got so it. colonoscopy is the answer. And so the answer to that, you know, I just want to say it in other words, uh, as Natarajan had said, they go all the way. They look at all of the colon. The and only time you do CT colonography is if a patient is too sick to have a colonoscopy. Yeah, 
Yeah. Then you do. But you know, there was a time they were pushing to do that instead. Right. You know, radiology. Radiology. Yeah. Yes, it doesn't make sense. It and failed. It, it failed it miserably. It completely failed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Doctor, um, was, Dr. Dr. Was, some of us are, some of us are concerned about the liquid that they give you to drink. That that solution is awful. Can you improve on that? Or is answer is, the answer is, I mean, they are working on that. You know, they are working on that. This is much better than what it used to be 20 years ago, what we have today. And the problem with that is this, now, even now they do have tablets, but they're all very expensive. Insurance companies don't pay for it. So Miralax, which is a polyethylene glycol, it is less expensive. You can get it for $10, $15, you know, and finish with that. Uh, now you can add like, you know, maybe uh, Gatorade with that to make it a little bit palatable, you know? Uh, that's what I would recommend. And uh, since you asked the question, the next wave, next generation of preparation would be much better. And um, Natarajan, that's a doctor who asked that question. And he, okay. he has not done his colonoscopy. I'm putting him out there. Unless he has done it since the last time we talked because of the prep. Oh. So, I yes, so I did. I did. Doctor, oh, I did. did. Thank you. Thank you. I'll give, I'm giving you a virtual hug <laughs> for doing it. Because you remember, I called you once to ask you about that tablet. It was because of him I called to ask you about the tablet instead of the solution. Because he said, if I can use tablet, then I'll do it. There is a tablet called a suit tab. I sent it to him. Oh, okay. so, yes, he said he has done it. I'm giving him virtual hug. Thank you for having done your colonoscopy. I was on his case. Oh my gosh. So, Dr. Famuiwa, please unmute and ask your question. Um, great. What is your comment on Cologuard? Right? That's sure. Mark. Sure, I can answer to that. I think, as I showed in the slide, Cologuard has. 8% false negative, 15% false positive, number one. And it does not pick up any polyp less than five millimeter. That is number two. So that it is still not as good as a colonoscopy. Number three, if the cologot comes back positive, you should, you should still have the colonoscopy. So I would do cologot. I'll tell you when I do cologot. When a patient is very hesitant, you do cologod. If it is positive, patient gets at least a stimulus. And he will say, okay, doc, I will do colonoscopy now. Or if the patient is very old, a lot of comorbid conditions, say, say 70 year old has heart disease, I will do cologod. If it is positive, then at least you can take him to the hospital, get an anesthesiologist involved. And even though it is risky, you can weigh the risk and benefit. Only those are all the reasons I will do Cologod. I do not believe Cologod is the test for screening. Still, you know, colonoscopy is the right test for screening, but there is a place for Cologod, as I mentioned, you know. Yeah. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I do quite a bit of Cologod. I do because of my population. Correct. correct. In one particular clinic they will not do colonoscopy. And I've, tell, I've told this story before, I don't know if you have heard it. I had a patient that I was encouraging year after year to do colonoscopy and he wouldn't do it. So I begged him to do Cologuard and I explained the process, you know, it's non-invasive, but when he agreed on one condition, if he's positive, you right. will follow with colonoscopy. Guess what? It came back positive. And it was a man of his words. Okay. He decided to follow with colonoscopy. He did it. He had polyps in every segment. See? And guess what? When the result came back, it was recommended that he had colonoscopy the next year. It was my first patient that had to be screened a year later and not five years later. He had CISO polyp that had almost boarded. So the next year, he had to have it again another year. So when you were presented, I was thinking, maybe they didn't cut it all the way. I said, nah, it probably almost has become cancerous. The, the GI doctor was probably scared that, no, I don't want to miss this one. He had 
colonoscopy every year for the first two or three years before now is five years. So color guard has a place in those people. If they are scared or for whatever reason, they don't want to do it, at least we get something. But I make them promise that if it's positive, we're going to, go to, we're going to do the real thing. So Dr. Oduyebo said, thanks for this very informative presentation. Please explain the dangers, if any, in using just any honey as opposed to pure honey to replace sugar in our diets. I mean, I, honey is much better than sugar. You know, um, I, I, would, I would recommend honey instead of sugar if you really want to use that, you know. Uh, there is, in fact, even there are some vitamins in honey. You know, not like a plain sugar. Number one, number two, honey does not have the same negative effect on the fatty, you know, inducing steatosis. Mm. So uh, honey would be a better than sugar. Mm. Thank you. So I think Haman is asking if uh, how extensive were diets in relation to other African and Caribbean um countries, you know, when you talked about Ghana. So what are so, the- Sure, sure, I'll answer to that. There are some data that has come up. Like for instance, um, you know, there are, there, there's a study that came from Dallas. It's called the Dallas Heart Study. In that study, they looked into different population. You know, this all came for echocardiogram or it's a heart. When they looked into the fatty liver by doing a magnetic resonance spectroscopy, they, they came up with African population as the least amount of fat in the liver as opposed to Caucasians or Hispanics. So by nature, by nature, Africans have the less tendency to accumulate fat by nature, by genetically. But unfortunately, the diet is the one such as eating red meat, you know, not doing exercise, increasing weight, is the one that causes fatty liver. Hmm. Am, am, I, am I making it you know, clear? Yes, it makes sense. It makes sense. Thank you. So Christiana says, looks like there are a lot of Americans with mild fatty liver despite diet restrictions. What is the prognosis of it advancing to liver cancer? I think well, if they have very mild disease, they don't advance to the liver cancer, number one. If they have inflammation and scar tissue, you don't have to have cirrhosis. Even if you have a stage two or three before cirrhosis, there is still higher probability of getting cancer. So 80% of the patients I see as a you know, steatotic liver, they don't get into trouble. You know, as long as they maintain just a diet and weight, 60 to 70 percent of my patients are able to bring down the liver enzymes to normal, just being on weight reduction, diet control, and exercise. You know, we, we can achieve that. Only 20 percent of the patients will require any pharmacologic agent. You know, the, even though the percentage is low because of the incidence is so, you know, 30%, the number, the volume is very high. So we have to find solution, you know? Thank you. Thank you so much for, <laughs> for that. That is true. Um, Ejim Sule is asking if you are able to share your slides. Uh, I don't understand because it's on YouTube. Ejim Sule, if you would uh, raise your hand and please, you know, um, maybe ask the question yourself. I don't understand it because this is on YouTube and you can always, you have access to it there too. So if that does not answer your question, please raise your hand so that you can ask it. Um, Haman is saying something about diabetes that I think you have to say something about. It says, interesting to hear that pre-diabetics could be developing resistance to insulin. He says it will be taking personal interest here with his health condition. So can you comment on that? Sure, sure. I think, you know, if I see a patient with pre-diabetic, 
with abnormal liver enzyme that is a red signal so i i you know i, I have a conversation at the time to my patient listen this is a time you have to wake up and just to cut down some carbohydrates they don't have to completely 180 degree modification even if they start cutting down even if like you know even they walk 2 to 3 miles a day 3 to 4 times a week you can see the change in the liver you know uh, so the reason is the, the the fat accumulates in the mitochondria of the liver cells mitochondria is the respiratory organ mitochondria is the one that gives energy to the human body so when you walk when you do exercise the fat from the mitochondria gets depleted so it doesn't get broken down and does not cause any damage into the mitochondria which again damages the liver cell you know so that is the reason fantastic so uh, benjamin is thanking you for your time and efforts um sister tina says very timely information and you know there's a question about heartburn with no response to medications heart sorry come again heartburn dyspepsia with no yes. response for oh, heartburn oh yes. this is okay this is not related to okay sure sure <laughs> yeah, heartburn you know, you know you know we get that we get that right right, right. You know, so there is that. a condition called functional gerd you know so when you say heartburn do you mean chest pain no If it is chest it, pain it could I, be I just think it, i think it's dyspepsia heartburn okay. um with no response to medications by that no response to ppi no response to so, you know that's a blockers yeah that is the patient they should be scoped and biopsied make sure they don't have h pylori you know, other conditions you know uh, delayed emptying gastritis those are all things we should look for if they are not responding to the your you know uh, garden type of variety treatment you know such as ppa or h2 blockers i would recommend that there is a condition called functional dyspepsia sometimes the ssri help them like you know serotonin uptake inhibitors they do help them and that's an that's an antidepressant correct um the um the is helpful also um large abdominal girth large abdomen i've seen people with uh, with large abdomen having um reflux correct we have this pepsia so correct. again weight loss good diet exercise would help that so um uh, what role can pharmacies play from the community pharmacies to ensure compliance with this screening that's a pharmacist asking the question so what <laughs> well you know that's a very no, actually i believe in pharmacist playing a major role in community we meant to that right because i think i always said that if we have a, a pharmacist in every community you know uh, taking care of the population reason is if you if we all know it's well known globally that medication induced diseases and death is very high the pharmacist can you know call the doctor and say listen do you think you are giving these two drugs together you what they are going to have you know liver injury can you change the dose right so they yes. can take an active role in community you know and they can tell the have you had a screening colonoscopy you are so you know how old are you so they can do a screening and they can promote that you know so i think you know every human being has you know we have some responsibility to help our fellow human being that's right i agree and even on this platform you don't have to be a doctor you don't have to be a pharmacist correct exactly you know, just sharing that this thing is very important let's do it it's just a screening test to prevent prevention is always better than cure it's better we prevent we do better preventing don't we in medicine today when something has happened we palliate we manage but we do it we do much better preventing so um dr t was asking about that food that the ganians are eating that you mentioned i think you said something they put under the 
you said the food that they eat that increases the, the yeah in the Ghana you mean the Ghanaians yes yeah I'm not sure the name of that it is actually it's like a starchy food they put it in a leaf apparently they it's underground 24 hours later or two days later they take it it becomes like a powdery almost it's a, it's like a tuber type of you know tuber yeah it's a plant. So- I wonder if it's a kinky. I said that. Yes, say again. Like Come again. Kinky. Yes. Something, you think that's something like that. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So it's not, you saw the direct correlation with fatty liver. It's because the reason is, this is just my observation. Yes. I have not done cause and effect analysis. So this is actually, it's like a potato. Potatoes are not good for fatty, for the steatotic liver disease. I recommend my patient to stay away from potatoes, except sweet potatoes are good. Sweet potatoes are good for the health, not your Idaho potatoes, you know. So similar, similar. Is it, is it the food? The Dr. Food? O. Is it what? Uh, Dr. T, somebody is speaking. One minute. Yeah, what did you say? Is it the fufu powder? If it's powdery, he said it's powdery. So we have the kenke, we have the fufu, we have the gari, and then we have the cocoa Okay, this one's come. This one comes from underground, and it's in, it's put in a leaf. Yes, that's what I was. I was going to comment on kenke is made out of corn, so I think he's probably talking about cassava or yam. Is it is it fixed in a leaf? Is it cooked or protected? Is it served in a leaf? Because kenke is in the leaf. Exactly. I know kinky. I've been to Ghana and I think it's kinky. Yes, kinky but kinky is, is made from corn. It's not a, yes. it's not a tuber yes. corn crop. Okay, yes. so so I can answer to that. Today I saw a, patient, a Mexican patient. Right, Mexicans have a higher incidence of steatotic liver disease. Reason is they use a lot of corn flour. I call them tortilla syndrome. You know, tortilla syndrome. And uh, so I, I tell them to avoid that. Corn flour is really not good, as well as the fructose-based sugar is not good. I mean, that has been scientifically proven, you know? Yes, and you know, I believe it's kinky. And um, thank you so much, Dr. Izugu, I'll be right with you. You know, when we talked about oils, we've talked about Dr. oils in, in Dr. Oh. On this platform. Dr. O, yes. uh, for the Ghanaian thing, uh, maybe it's abodo, they have kinky and they have abodo. Okay, so um, it doesn't. It's not Ghanaian. It cannot it's Ghanaian. Say, Ghanaian. Uh, I, I'm saying Natarajan is not a Ghanaian. Oh, I see. I see. So okay, he's is saying it described the food as being in leaf. Okay, he was guidance and um, descriptions of what it could be. I'll, I'll so ask my. Let's go do our homework. And okay. see what it could be. And I'll follow up with him also because this is important. He is seeing direct correlation with uh, fatty liver. Uh, it okay. behooves us to educate our population so that we at least decrease the consumption of that food. Okay. Yeah, so, if I'm wrong, please correct me. Yeah? Uh, yes. I'm gonna I'm gonna follow up on you on that. And you know, we have lots of amazing Ghanaians so that we can figure out what it is. And your Ghanaian um, patients, if you can ask them also and they can tell us the name. I know you text it to me. We'll appreciate it. So I was gonna say with oils, we've talked about oils a lot, oils that are good. Corn oil is bad. Corn is high in GMO. So canola oil is made out of corn. It's not a good oil. Olive oil is excellent oil, but don't cook it. When you cook it, you've destroyed it. You use it, you know, in salads or foods that, you know, uh, you don't cook. The oils that are stable um, when heated Mm -hmm. up are things like grapeseed oil, um, um, avocado oil, coconut oil. Those three, the excellent oils. Just a reminder to remind us the oils that are good to cook with and to eat. Olive oil is good for salads, but don't cook it. But those things, see, the corn you're talking about, look at how 
in your practice, what you have observed, you need to publish that, that you've seen correlation with uh, uh, fatty liver. I'm not surprised. Or steatotic liver disease. I have to get that into my skull. It's going to take a while. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to take, you know, because there's no more fatty liver, steatotic liver disease. So Dr. Izugu, kindly unmute. I am so excited because of all these changes and that I'm learning many of them tonight. It's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. Really excellent. A um, couple of comments. I do agree with you 100%. Pre-diabetes is not a benign condition. Uh, we see that a lot in cardiovascular disease and uh, already they're coming with vascular problems. We do do a lot of uh, color guard, again, because of cardiovascular complications. When patients are sent, you know, there are medications, there are is a high uh, anesthesia risk and uh, anticoagulations, a lot of issues. So sometimes we do that as a first thing to before we go to the next. Uh, question is, is there any data on the use of things like uh, Ozempic and stuff like that on fatty liver issues? Anything? Excellent, excellent. So again, sorry, any... Uh... Uh, any data on the use of things like Ozempic on any of the... Oh, you know, oh yes, 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 yes. 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 Oh, yes. Ozempic, the answer is... Yes. The, injectable, yes, yes. the injectable for diabetes that decreases weight. Yeah, there is a, there is, there's a paper that came in New England Journal of Medicine, Philip Newsom from UK, he published it, you know. Uh, it's, it's a... Not only it, the patients lost weight, they also normalized the liver enzymes, you know. They did not do any biopsy to see the progression of the liver disease, but there is a signal. So currently there is an ongoing trial using the GLP-1 agonist. Yes. You know, it's a GLP-1 agonist. Answer is yes. There is a good signal that will help them, you know, not only to lose weight, also to uh, improve their liver. Beautiful. Right. Fantastic. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Doc, Dr. Izugu, drive safely. <laughs> Thank you, yes. <laughs> I see you finally left the office. Fantastic. I did. Thank you. <laughs> so um, there's a question here that um, you should please advise on where to get, uh, how to find out more about Mediterranean um, diet. And I don't sure. know, online, huh? right? It's a doctor Google. <laughs> Google it. Yeah, yeah. Google, Google does a good job of that, yes. So another question says, but there's no red or purple Gatorade with the Miralax. Yes. I mean, Miralax, so, so what I do is when I'm doing colonoscopy, I also advocate to take Dulcolax along with the Miralax, you know, for colonoscopy. Oh. I ask them to take two Dulcolax with each split dose. In other words, total four Dulcolax. That really cleans it up well. Now, patients, for constipation, it's a totally different story. You know, for constipation, if Merilax is not helping, then we have to go for other tablets like, you know, uh, True Lamps or Amitiza or Linzas, you know. So we really have to go to the stimulant type of uh, uh, pharmacologic agent, you know, that is the last resort I give it to my patient, especially Linzas, you know. Nice, nice. So diet helps that even better. So somebody wrote to me that some procedures are no longer using the preps. Since? That colonoscopy is private charted, that some procedures are no, are no longer using the preps. Colonoscopy. I don't understand what he meant by some procedures, but I'm assuming since we're talking about colonoscopy, do you know doing colonoscopy without prepping? No, no, no. It's not possible. It's not possible. So it says the US FDA has approved a new option for patients who need to clear out their bowels before a colonoscopy, a lemon lime drink, that's designed to be a lot tastier than many other options out there. And this happened July 7, 2023, that the FDA approved the lemon lime drink. 
maybe it, I don't know whether it is colite. We used to use colite, you know. It's again is a peg solution with the lemon, lemon light. You know, I don't know whether if it's a new approval. Is that so? Is that yeah, it says, I think I think there is one. I mean, somewhere I read it, but I'm not aware of that. I'm not used to that. So I don't have much idea about that at all. You know, much experience, nor knowledge on that. Well, time will tell. We'll see how it works. <laughs> Thank you so much, though, for that information. That's something that we need to look out for to see if it works. If you, if you know, indeed, if FDA approved it uh, and it works, that's fantastic. Yeah, it, it, it hasn't hit to my table yet, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that is fantastic. So, uh, Dr. Ajagwe greets us. Dr. Ajagwe is in Ogbomosho in Nigeria, and you know, he says hello to everyone. Hello, sir. Um, Another question, what is the correlation between NASH and HIV? Oh, very good question, excellent. In fact, in fact, at Hopkins, they are looking into that. So what happens in HIV, the, the medications itself causes dyslipidemia, you know, the antiretroviral medication. And so there is an ongoing study looking into that. And these patients are more increased incidence of steatotic liver disease among HIV patient because of the hyperlipidemia and dyslipidemia caused by the medication, you know? Hmm. Well, it is, it's a, that's a good question. The answer is you are right. It's a good question. Uh, yes. Please keep us updated when the um, result of that study comes out. That's a good one. So um, Sister Lamy from California, said, does the honey have to be 100% pure on the label? When you said, yeah, honey is good. Should it be the 100% uh, pure honey that is better? And uh, Dr. Ajagbe responded that date syrup is a healthier substitute for sugar also. So what's your comment? I mean, the answer is yes, you know, yes. the pure honey. Okay. Because you don't want any adulterated, you know. Okay, so um, there's a follow-up to that FDA-approved um, formulation, the lemon lime formulation. It says the FDA approved a colonoscopy prep tablet that may make it easier for patients as they prepare for a colorectal cancer screening procedure. Until now, patients had to spend at least a day preparing for their colonoscopy by drinking a gallon or so of a liquid laxative followed by a lot of time in the bathroom. Yes. It's going to continue like that, though. What do you think? Because even this tablet will take you to the bathroom, right? <laughs> I mean, there's nothing. You have to clean the colon because colon is always full of stool. See, what happens when you eat within 12 to 18 hours, that food comes to the colon. The main reason we are splitting the doors is because if you have finished the first dose, that cleans your left side of the co you know, colon. The second dose cleans the right side of the colon. Oh, wow. That is why you are taking a second dose. If you, I can easily say who did not take the second dose when you do colonoscopy. The right side of the colon will not be clean at all. Then I know that that patient didn't take the second dose because sometimes you have to wake up two in the morning uh, you know, to do the second dose and they sleep over or whatever happens, they didn't take it, you know. Um, and I do agree we need better preparation tool and it's going to happen mm -hmm. because everything gets better and better, you know. Um, but no matter what tool we have, we cannot avoid that toilet. Exactly. exactly. For exactly. colonoscopy, exactly. You know, you've got to clean out. Otherwise, you, uh, the doctor cannot see Correct, correct. Well, yes. So another question, is agave okay? Agave is, uh, is a plant-based uh, sweetener. Is it okay? I don't know if you're familiar. I with mean, that. I think it is a non, uh, I think it follows with the non-sweetener. Correct, what is that? Um, when they looked into the, it's, it's, it's better than the sugar. Yes. No, it's better than the sugar. And non-caloric, am I correct? 
Yes. Yeah, then, then that would be fine. It is a non-caloric. As long as it doesn't add any calories, they're fine. But we've had that discussion before on Medical Mondays with the experts here. And it was said that agave is supposed to be, I think, green, but it's been very processed also. And, it, you know, the, the, the end product that is sold is white. And so that's why the, uh, you know, that we should, it's it's not as good as it is promoted that the date syrup may be, may be better. I didn't say anything at first because you know what? I'm not an expert okay. at this. <laughs> I don't know if I'm, you know, I'm just trying to remember things that we have learned here on Medical Mondays. I used to eat agave, agave. after that presentation. I, I have not eaten it, but the date syrup is a, is a good one. Um, so, Somebody wants to contact you for telehealth. Um, I must say, you know, remind us that give or give the disclaimer that we sharing medical information, correct and cogent one, but we are not establishing um, physician patient interaction here. But anyone who wants to see um, Dr. Ravendra for colonoscopy please, is the best. And um, you can always reach him through me. I have his number. I have the back number now. So I've been told that he's booked for months. You cannot see him and all of that. And I'm like, I was fretting just before we started the program tonight. He let me into this secret that there's a number I can call. He actually have openings. So um, I'll share that whenever we need to. So Dr. Ajagwe says lifestyle modification, modification is imperative for excellent health outcomes. And that is true. Um, John Aquan says when he jogs sometimes, his heart gets tightened. What is the cause? When he jogs. Yes, his heart gets tightened. Thank God we have a cardiologist on the forum also. Should, I mean, we, defer, that, should we defer to the cardiologist? <laughs> or you want to tackle it? I, I mean, the two only thing, if it is a non-cardiac, esophageal spasm could do that. You know, if it is non-cardiac, but first you want to rule out cardiac. We don't know. Oh. He says when he jogs, Dr. Izugu. <laughs> yes, cardiac. Dr. I always Izugu tell my friend. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you are absolutely right. You need to see a cardiologist. Any exercise induced symptoms require, that's a tip of to have somebody look into it. It's a, I think it's that, that's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my cardiology friends always say heart comes first, stomach comes second. That's exactly <laughs> true. <laughs> what are they trying to say? <laughs> No, that is true. Yeah, if you are getting symptoms with activity, yeah, get it checked out because activity is important, but then making sure that the heart is okay to continue is important too. Yes. So, um, Dr. Remy Olodun, oh my gosh, that's my big bro from South Carolina. Good evening, sir. He said, how good is palm oil for cooking? Palm oil? Yes. Uh, I don't have any idea about palm oil at all. <laughs> but, you know, I think the coconut oil is good. That much I know. Yes. And sesame seed oil, that is good. Yes. Palm oil, I have not, you know. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know anything about palm oil. There's no literature on that. So I don't know an answer to that, you know. Well, we know that palm oil has saturated and uh, yes, unsaturated yes. Uh, fats. And so we allopaths tend to shy away from anything that is highly yes. saturated or unsaturated, you know, fats. But naturopathic doctors, you know, swear by palm oil. That is excellent. That that's what we should be eating. So I'm going to take your stance. <laughs> <laughs> that we need literature. I need to see research. I need to see, you know, um, I just need to see hard evidence to be able to uh, properly advise on that. So the jury's out. 
it's uh, allopaths against naturopaths in that one. <laughs> you know, um, Dr. Veronica from California is thanking you for, you know, uh, okay. for this session. Um, Sister Lamy says, is granite oil good for cooking? No, I can answer that. No, no. So grapeseed oil, avocado oil or coconut oil? Those are the ones that are good. Um, Benjamin says, oh, greetings, Madam Commissioner, Dr. O. Okay. <laughs> okay, I think this is a personal one. I will tackle that. Oh, no, no, no. It says, he sent an email in respect of the below request. Good day, friends and family. Kindly vote for him, Benjamin Masomino Femi under the Apostle Hayford Ali Humanitarian Award. It needs our votes and support to win the award and that we should please share it with our friends. And remember, um, you, can all, you can also vote through your social media handles. Thanks for taking the time to cast your vote for him. It will be grateful if you can help push this forward. This is for an award, and it's one of our Medical Mondays family. So, um, Benjamin, I'll advise that you please email me this information so I can blow it out, send it by email out and by text messages to people, and they can just click on it and do the needful for you. So, Dr. Aluya said, hello, greetings. What is the role of P. Pagama? in the redistrib redistribution of fat in the gut. Any role of metformin with this? Okay, oh, oh so, so metformin has a protective role in the liver. Okay. Yeah, that, that has been shown. Um, now you, you, you may be talking the PEEP or alpha on delta agonist. Maybe that's what he's asking. If that is the case, there is an, on in fact, I was involved in a study with that, there is a role for fatty liver with that molecule. Did I answer your question? Answer is yes. P power alpha and delta agonist, you know. Dr. Aluya, are you there? Dr. Aluya is a national president at the Nigerian American Public Affairs Committee. So he says, uh, he says on the point, okay. Right on point. He's also, you know, a big guy. In New Jersey. Yes, you're yeah. right. Good. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> yes, thank you so much. And and that's one of the the few things that a lot of people don't talk about the advantages of using metformin for a lot of things. Um, outside of the multiple things that it does, uh, PIPA gamma um, alpha, like you did say, and then the delta component of it is one way that uh, metformin helps in as an anti-metabolite in helping to redistribute, reducing the redistribution of, of fat in the in the gut. And that's been shown and it's really, really great. Um, Metformin has gotten a bad rap for a lot of things, but uh, it's such a great drug. And till today, and uh, hopefully in the next, you know, few years, we'll still be the number one choice of drug in the management of diabetes and, you know, um, and uh, obesity, as we say, so look at it. Um, I've always thought that um, if you know how metformin works, one of the ways it actually does, like you said, with the semaglutide, uh, the GLP-1s, uh, the GLP-1s, in my belief, has been derived as a component of metformin, one of the ways of which it works. And I think down the road, we'll see that effect as it comes up again. And you know, uh, I'm a huge advocate for it. Uh, it's actually re uh, reduced the telophate phase of of cell um, uh, death, and also is the only drug that has been FDA approved as an anti-aging drug. So all of this down the road, you hear that tomorrow they'll tell you, oh, uh, Ozempic and all that uh, are very good for for reducing aging again. We're going to hear that, but. Um, these are the things that metformin does. And I thank you for that uh, explanation as well. So yeah, before there, you go, there is, a, there is oh, some evidence. It also decreases the mortality, you know. I think uh, it's, a, it's a UK study showed that uh, metformin user 
they live a little bit longer than when they compare to the, this is again uh, studies, you know, um, population based study. You are correct, you know, metformin prolongs the life too, longevity. Yes, it does. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. And Dr. Aluya, you made another comment that I want you to wrap up together here. Some of the non nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors treatment in HIV infection. Yes, it's, it's yeah, crazy. That is true. That is true. Go ahead. Over time, it's something I'd noticed. And um, before it actually became such a big uh, out, out of blown proportion, and the studies have been showing. And uh, in my practice for my HIV patients, uh, I see that not everybody, but a few people, and I think there, there are some genetic component and, and, and modification um, in some individuals with propensity towards hyperlipidemia. Not everybody, but you find out that a few people who take, you know, non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase, they tend to have very high cholesterol and especially the triglycerides. And if you check that level, it's like unbelievably high. And it can actually double or quadruple within a month of using those drugs. And that's why once you start somebody on any of those meds, you have to go back, check their cholesterol level um, within three months. And if it's really high, you may have to start them on a, on a what do you call it? On a, on a starting, right, on a starting. But then you have to be careful to make sure that you know, a combination of statin and those medications do not increase their, their liver enzymes. Otherwise, you have to stop it uh, and put them on genfibrosy or any other stuff, uh, as a matter of fact, or put them on a new HIV medication uh, as, as it may be. Yeah, protease inhibitors also increase uh, cholesterol in these patients. We have to monitor the, the liver, uh, the cholesterol and liver function all the time. Thank you so much for that uh, comment observation. Thank you. Um, doc, um, Dr. Ravindra, do you have a comment on that? On the HIV? No, he is uh, right, exactly. I mean, I was there. <laughs> yes, I was learning from him. Yeah. He's right on point. Thank you. So uh, Dr. Jagwe says, is there any positive benefit using the probiotics with laxatives? I mean, there is no, not the combination, excuse me, there is no, the, not the combination, you know, probiotics and laxatives are so different mode of action. The probiotics are, or the, the, you know, the intestinal microbiome, they suppresses the inflammation in the gut, whereas the laxatives promote the motility of the colon or depending upon what kind of laxative you use, it also increases the secretion, you know, stimulates that. So that both of them have two different mode of action. So they do not complement each other, you know. Got you. And that's true. Uh, Haman uh, said he would like to contact you. So I just suggested that I'll get your email address and send sure. it because it's in London. So you may have something private. To sure, sure, sure. I'll be glad to. You know. Thank you. Thank you so much. And mm -hmm. Haman, to vote in London, I'm going to send the email out. And um, you, you just click on that link and vote for him. You can vote anywhere uh, for him in there. So G, or no, it's called G. That's Dr. Jagwe again, clarified border. Yes, I know G, right. You know G. Uh, it's clarified butter with vitamins A, D, E, K. It's also excellent oil for frying and cooking. Ghee. Okay. I don't know about ghee, but it's no, a, I mean, they use a lot in India. And it's good. Yeah. That's where I've seen it. Ghee from my Indian brothers and sisters. Yeah. So um, Mr. Yomilawal said, thank you for this fabulous presentation. If you don't mind, can you please comment on what choices pre-diabetic patients that are already very skinny have, since most diets that are recommended will most likely make them lose weight even further against their will. It's generally assumed that diabetic patients are obese or tend to be. To be but that's not always the case, it's right. Correct, that is correct. 15% of patients 
has, we call them as a lean state articular disease. So it is their metabolism. You know, uh, if you look into those patients, they don't have to lose weight. They may have dyslipidemia. They may have high cholesterol or high triglycerides. So they may have to correct that, you know. Uh, so even the diet-wise, they can eat, take the same calorie. Caloric intake, they should not, you know, cut it. They can redistribute the type of carbohydrate they eat. They can substitute more proteins. That's what they should do. They don't have to lose weight. Okay, so, um, okay, that's fair enough. They should not go on Mediterranean diet per se. Even the Mediterranean diet is not meant to lose weight, you know? It's not, but people lose weight on it. Well, the caloric intake. So if you're having a small portions, correct? Yeah. Right. Yes. That, that's how you control it. Whereas the lean patient doesn't have to control the caloric. They have to eat, they have to eat the right food. You're right. You are absolutely right about that. So um, Elizabeth, you remember Elizabeth? Elizabeth Tontin? Do you remember her? Elizabeth? Uh, Tontin. HIV, Kalitra, oh, in the beginning. Uh, Elizabeth was one of our reps when HIV was still HIV, when we didn't have lots of medications to treat. You remember that? Right, right. In the 2000 and 2003, 2003. Right, right, right. Yeah. She's on the platform. She said, thank you so much for this informative presentation that she hopes to have you as a presenter again soon. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, she's on. And um, Dr. Aluya said something about, like you said, Mexicans have a high propensity to liver steastosis. Have you seen the same amongst Filipinos? It says that um, it has so much, I, I have seen so much to the point that they need liver transplant. Answer is what yes. Your take on why is sure, it sure. genetics? So, so Filipinos have higher incidence of steatotic liver disease. You know, I have many patients. And it's, in fact, some of them do even very progressed liver disease. The ma majority of them have diet. They eat a lot of pork. You know, they have, the, for them, it is a diet. They, they have not done any, what is called PNPLA3 TMS, TM6 SF. It is a couple of genes which are responsible to promoting steatotic liver disease. And if you look into globally, that distribution is not seen on Filipinos. But Filipino diet consists mostly of a lot of fatty food and high rich you know, in triglycerides and uh, carbohydrate, rice and pork. So they have that, that's the main reason driving for, you know, reason for them to develop steatotic liver disease. Hmm. Wow. Thank you so much. I don't see a lot of that population, but thank you so very much for that. Um, I want to just say I am blown off the water. Madam VP, our very own Madam CEO, Lara Okunubi, is right now in Nigeria. You know what time that is? And she is on the platform also. Um, and she has been. I just noticed that. And I want to welcome Dr. Uh, Omotosho for being here tonight. And, you know, everyone else, I just, you know, I noticed some new faces and I just wanted to um, acknowledge them. And Dr. Ojimba. Dr. Ojimba is a rising star. You have to meet him. Psychiatrist, you know, just started private practice in, in Maryland. Oh. And um, onto big things, you know. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing him on the platform. So welcome, all of you. And, uh, whew. What a night of education. I have learned so much. Thank you so much again, Natarajan. I appreciate you so much. What would be your parting words for us? Well, oh, excellent. Well, I mean, first of all, I enjoyed, you know, uh, being with you all today with all my friends and colleagues and sharing the knowledge. I think we should still prevent colon cancer among African population. You know, uh, we should increase the uh, screening rate, number one, and then just to be cognizant of the diet. Only those two things I would recommend, you know, and thank you for sharing your knowledge with me. I also learned and 
hopefully I will be here one more time. You know, maybe uh, there's so many new things are evolving, you know. Before the end of the year. Yes, yes. <laughs> to share with us again. Thank you. I have learned so much that will modify my practice in diabetic patients and all of that. And um, Dr. Veronica from uh, California said, quick conclusion to all of this. I love it. You know, when you have all these educators on the platform, you have no reason not to learn. She said, so common oils good for cooking. Heat up. Common oils that are good for cooking are the following. Grapeseed oil, avocado oil, coconut oil, and olive oil is excellent. Good for use unheated. So great for salads, but do not eat it up. Corn oil is not good. Heated up or for cooking. Right? Thank right. you. Isn't that amazing? So she gave us a conclusion on oils and, you know, that is right on the money. Haman says, excellent, excellent experience that he has this morning all the way from London, England. Thanks, Dr. Ravendra, he said, and participants. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, for another amazing Medical Mondays with Dr. O. Till we see next week, please stay safe. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Thank you, Toyin. Thank you.